Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Nick Files. I'm your host, Nick Mulay. Uh, I just want to get started just very quickly. Oh, and I just realized I forgot to... Uh, that's weird. I don't remember having the brand color to blue, but let me just fix that up quickly. Um, anyways, while I'm getting that fixed up... Um, for starters, I want to apologize at first for being a couple minutes later than usual on what I was doing just right beforehand, before I got on here is, hello, Nigel, good to see him. I know I'm I'm about 15 minutes late, so I apologize for that. Um, what I was doing was I was putting together the newest slideshows, which, you know, trust me, normally I would do this several days in advance, but because, again, I've been so heavily involved in making new ones, including ones for... Uh, by request for some upcoming investigations, I, I've I've just been swamped. So putting the slideshows for this episode's, I mean today's episode was, I had to go really fast on. I mean I still managed to take my time to make sure that they were organized. I had everything correctly, but fortunately, I mean I went a little bit faster than usual, but I was still able to do it carefully so I could have these slideshows put together. So that's that's the reason for my delay today. So I do apologize for that. Um, so for today, obviously, as we all know, we're going to be now continuing on more with part four of Athens, Ohio. I got a couple of locations once again to present. Um, however, what we're going to start off with first is actually one of the slideshows that we did last week, which was um, on Mount Nebo that we were talking about the re the reason why we're kind of I'm re pre re representing it is because there was actually some other additional information about this case that I didn't see previously compared to what I had last week, which wasn't a very long slideshow. Um, I decided to, uh, with this new and in additional information, I decided to uh, represent it because I think it would have, not only would it take up a majority of the show, but, well, not necessarily a majority of the show, but it would take a good portion of it, let's just say, because it's only about like 15 slides that um, I think it would be really interesting. And you know what? Let's be honest. Well, we're going to be, for those who didn't see it last week, I'll tell you guys this. What's really fascinating about it is that um, you can kind of say it focuses on one of our paranormal ancestors, if you will, um, from the mid 19th century. So yes, a lot of them, a lot of these early investigators, as well as spiritualists, psychics, mediums, clairvoyants, sensitives, uh, empaths, um, you know, you, you know, like any, anybody in that subject you think of, yes, a lot of them were exposed as frauds but there were some others that were quite legitimate this one however is kind of in kind of in between yes it was maybe partially fraud but on another occasion there was a lot of real like real paranormal phenomenon that occurred and that's where we're going to get started with the first slide so uh just before i get started start with that i just want to give out some shout outs hello natalie good to see you good afternoon rita hello yvonne I'm sure this will probably increase as we uh, as we move forward. So let me go through this fun scheme again. As <laughs> okay, what do we got here? Uh, I will start off with, and I always got as usual. I always got to check the phone to make sure that things are working correctly. Okay, fine. I'll just respond to this guy. Bickle Tom's in the house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and while I'm doing this too, I also have to share the link to the show because since I'm now I'm on a ninth network, since I'm unable to broadcast officially on the ninth network, because StreamYard only allows you to broadcast date destinations i kind of have to do all of this at the same time and i'll tell you right now until we can get more destinations so it's almost a living nightmare when you gotta <laughs> you gotta share this out on your own especially when you're the only one okay so let me make sure this is working let's see if it's showing on screen okay here we go so for those who didn't see it last week we were talking about this last week but i'm going to do it like i said I'm representing this one for those who haven't seen it yet, but one of the locations that you guys may have missed uh, last week, we were 
we were focusing on one location that was called Mount Nebo, which is located out in the area of Athens, Athens, Ohio, of course. Um, you know, just one second. I'm just sending this to the sending this uh, link to the page. Okay, I'm gonna have to probably do this while while I'm speaking. So um, surprisingly out of now for surprisingly out of all these locations that, that I usually present, normally I would usually have I would have pictures of the event, I mean of these locations themselves, but well, you guys will get an understanding why I had a map fo- a, a supposed map of the location instead of the actual photograph. So um you know what? Here, I'm just about finished with sharing this. So give me one second here, guys. <laughs> See, if I was able to do this um, right before the broadcast, I would, but it unfortunately doesn't work that way. <laughs> Okay, that is now just about it of everything involving the phone. So I am going to put this phone down, and that is going to be officially it. <laughs> okay, so getting right, uh, let's uh, let's get started with the history of this place. So, located northeast of the plains in Ohio is Mount Nebo, a hilltop that once served as the grounds of a cabin owned by Jonathan. Uh, Hang on a second. I'm surprised the picture didn't show up. Hang on one second here. Technical difficulty. <laughs> uh, where is... Oh, I see what happened here. Okay. I know exactly what happened. Somehow the transition got delayed. So let's try that again. <laughs> was able to get that fixed, fortunately. Let's try that again. Okay, here. Okay, here we go. Um, yep. All right. So, as I said, located northeast of the plains in Ohio is Mount Nebo, a hilltop that once served as the grounds of a cabin owned by Jonathan Coons in the 1850s. Coons and his family operated a log cabin seance room in Mount Nebo. From 1852 to 1855. No photos. And here's the reason why I don't have any photos of the actual location. is because no photos of Mount Nebo are known to exist. Though modern day maps, like the one I showed right at the beginning, place it near the intersection of Sand Ridge and Mill Creek Roads in Dover Township, north of Athens. The story goes that upon arriving there, the Coons family began to experience strange phenomena, as such as paranormal activity and other worldly sensations. Curious people have traveled to Athens County to test the supernatural for more than 160 years, predating the Civil War. Jonathan and Abigail Coons' family was, was the first to hold public seances in 1852 inside their spirit room, which operated until 1858. Spiritualists and skeptics traveled from all over early America to witness the family of mediums and their talents. Jonathan Coons, the head of the, the, head of the family, and his wife Abigail had nine children. They were self-educated farmers, but were well-versed in politics and the philosophy of the times. The Coons moved with their family to Mount Nebo in 1835 and made a living by farming. Eventually, the news had spread to Dover Township in Athens County that two sisters in upstate New York spoke with a ghost. Early in 1852, Coons had come across newspaper descriptions of the Fox family wrappings and had at once, had at once made a personal investigation of the growing phenomenon. He attended several seances throughout Ohio and allegedly learned from the spirits that he was a gift medium. When he returned, when he returned home, he also discovered that Abigail and his oldest son, Nahum, I guess that's how you say it correctly, were also endowed with psychic abilities. So 
Excuse me. So according to Brian Collins, the Gawande chair, if I'm saying that correct, in Indian religion and philosophy at Ohio University, the spiritualism movement hit in the 19th century after the Fox sisters began communicating with the spirit of a murdered peddler through table tapping. It was believed that by talking through mediums to the dead, aspects of the afterlife in heaven could be revealed. Despite seeming so taboo, the movement was based in Christianity. After holding a number of seances of their own, the Coons were ordered by spirits to build what was dubbed their spirit room. They were given the exact specifications on how to build on how to build it, the size, the furnishings, and the equipment to use. The Coons immediately went to work and following the spirit's instructions, constructed a log cabin that was 12 by 14 feet had three shuttered windows, a single door, and a seven-foot-high ceiling. The room was then furnished with benches that would hold about 20 people. The spirits also requested that they equip the spirit room with a number of musical instruments, a tenor drum, a bass drum, two fiddles, a guitar, an accordion, a trumpet, a tin horn, a tea bell, a triangle, and a tambourine. Coons was, not, however, not a wealthy man and could not afford all of the instruments. Plus, he had trouble finding them in this remote part of Ohio, but managed to order some and borrow the rest from neighbors. After another seance, the spirit then demanded two tables, a rack for the musical instruments, and wire with which to suspend a few small bells and some images of doves that were cut from sheets of copper. After faithfully following all of these instructions, the Coons began giving public seances. Coons, Abigail, and Nahum acted as mediums, and in the darkened cabin, the spirits began giving lengthy communications on various spiritual subjects, as well as concerts on the musical instruments. Neighbors from all over the region began descending on the spirit room in Mount Nebo. Attracted by not only the rumors about what was taking place there, but also because of because the racket made by the spirits could be heard for a mile in any direction. Coons converted to spiritualism in early 1852, and he and his family spent six months privately developing their skill. Afterward, he was driven to create a home circle, and he, well, that's. That's kind of a little bit what I was saying before, but built a log cabin meant for seances next to the family home. I'll just have to take that out later. Uh, Coons also built a machine which acted as a battery for the spirits. And this is an actual photo or kind of like a uh, blueprint of what the machine apparently looked like. I actually tried going around to look for a photo of the actual machine, but unfortunately I was unsuccessful. So Either no photographs of it had survived or there was just never any photos taken of it. I mean, you have to remember, too, this was the 1850s. So, yes, photography was was around, but it was still in its early infancy. I mean, in those days, not, not, too, many, not too many people made, took photos at that time. And even sketches such, such as this, for example, was relatively rare. So at first, just local. So at first, just locals attended. But soon, it was not long before people across the country were flocking to witness the spiritual experience. Though the practice was accused of being linked to devil worship, research shows Coons to be a religious man. One book describes him as a strong Christian who agreed with many institutions of Christianity at the time. He believed his communication with spirits further affirmed one's belief in heaven. The family quickly became acclaimed spiritualists in the area, with many traveling far in order to experience their seances and commune with the dead in their spirit room. Charles Partridge, a well-known New York publisher, later wrote that he found that at least at least 50 people attended I mean, at least 50 people gathered for the first performance that he attended. Many of them were from various parts of Ohio, but there were there were representatives from other states too. 
Coons, on the advice of the spirits, gave preference to those coming from far away. Though there were no admissions or other charges to attend the seances, but those who stayed the night at the Coons home usually contributed some offering. Throughout this, Coons was still working and maintaining his family's farm. He was at times so exhausted that he fell asleep during the seances, and there is little reason to believe that the spirit room was ever a money-making project. And while it may have not made money, it certainly attracted attention. I mean, you have to remember, again, being in the mid-19th century, yes, spiritualism was very popular and very high, so I can sure understand why this attracted so many people from across the country, because in those days, you know, it was yes, it was popular, but wherever you lived, it was it was a rare gathering, if you will. Um, you know, this was, and this was something that was, again, in spite of it sometimes being labeled as devil worship in those days, compared to like what it was 200 years prior, you know, like throughout the 1600s, and of course, including the infamous Salem witch trials where people were considered witches or worshipers of the devil, thinking they were worshiping Satan for this. It must have been a really interesting era to see it no longer necessarily being devil worship, but actually something people could attend from all over the country. So in my opinion, whether these were actual seances or just may or were just frauds, this it, oh my god, just and of course my phone has to call me. <laughs> all right, I'm fine. <laughs> Okay, you know what? Let's see what everyone's saying now, because I'm sure. <laughs> yes, Eric, everything's fine. <laughs> what's up, Lauren? Good to see you. Hey, Dom, what's up, brother? Good, to see, Haven't seen you here in a while. Good to see you. Hello, Charles. I'm doing just fine. Okay. Anyways, enough with the scaring. <laughs> Continuing forward. But no, actually, no, what I was trying to say before that happened was that my opinion, this probably would have to, I would, I would kind I kind of see this in a way of being like the first, if you want to kind of call it the first public paranormal investigations, because I mean, it's not exactly as how it is like what we do today, but again, having 20 to 50 people gathering around for seances it's got to be the earliest version of public investigations. So as published, so published accounts soon began to appear in journals and spiritualist newspapers. And from these reports, it becomes quickly obvious that the seances were not for spectators with fragile, fragile nerves. The exhibit exhibition was often loud and the spirits Spirit's performances on the musical instruments were usually ear-shattering. All the reports, whether we choose to believe them or not, agree that in the total darkness of the crowded room, it would have been impossible for the coons themselves to provide the deafening and boisterous entertainment. Sharon Hatfield, the author of Enchanted Ground, The Spirit Room of Jonathan Coons, a nonfiction book describing the events of the, the Coon Spirit Room said a lot of people who went there were simply overjoyed because it because if you felt you had no proof that you were immortal, it would change the way you live the rest of your life. So as for the seances, according to Hatfield, Coons, I mean Coons the uh, Coons's program usually followed a set routine. The Coons would welcome guests at times around 20 in the audience into his home with the medium sitting at a table. After the audience was seated, the Coons would treat them to a song on his fiddle. I mean, Coons would treat them to a song on his fiddle before blowing out the can before blowing out a candle and the door and windows closed, dimming the setting to pitch black. Once a candle was blown out and the room was dark. A musical program began with different instruments coming in throughout. 
the start of the seance was usually announced by the banging of the bass drum, which one witness compared to the firing of a to the firing of a cannon in the close quarters. Then Coons, who sat at a table with his wife and son beside him, would start up would start to play a lively tune on his fiddle. Coons claimed the musicians were the spirits. So this is where kind of kind of where the fraud side of things comes from. Voices also spoke through a trumpet. In moments, all of the other instruments would join in, keeping perfect time, although played with unseen hands. What is more astounding, the reports all stated was that the instruments did not remain stationary, but would circle the room, playing wildly as they danced above the heads of the spectators. Visitors reported seeing objects levitate and instruments playing notes without musicians. And this is actually this is one of the few sketches I was able to find about supposedly the events that occurred in the spirit room. So I was fortunate enough to find something like this. I don't know if what I'm about to bring up is what's described in this sketch, but it does give again physical demonstrations. So during one seance, Dr. G. Swan of Cincinnati wrote later of a flying tambourine. One moment I would feel it on my head or brushing my hair, and the next moment it would be on the other side of the room. The triangle was also carried about the room and played in the same manner. Another witness, John Gage of Illinois, reported that the triangle dashed about over the heads of the visitors it was occasionally thrust almost in my face so that I was afraid that it would hit me. On one of its flights, the triangle dropped into his wife's lap and then smacked him, smacked him upside of the head. Both agreed that it weighed close to 20 pounds. Okay, so something like that, that does, again, maybe that there is some type of skepticism to that, but... This is kind of one of those things I kind of see somewhat in between. I'm, <clears throat> is it paranormal? I'm not. I or is it, is it is it just a trick that they were doing? I'm not sure to be honest. So, obviously, for those watching, definitely give your opinions and let me know what you think. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, according to a, now, according to another witness, the floating instruments would play in unison. And were so loud that it made the whole house roar so as to almost deafen us. No one seemed to recognize any of the tunes that the tunes that the instruments played, but they were but they were melodies of some sort and not just noise. Charles Partridge stated that the instruments would start together and then stopped abruptly, as if by some signal. The music was sometimes accompanied by songs that were sung and what seemed to be like human voices. John Gage described them as unearthly. The words, of, the words, all of the witnesses agreed, were apparently not in English. Throughout all of this through, the master of ceremonies was not Jonathan Coons, but rather a spectral voice that came through the tin horn. He called himself John King, and he proclaimed that he was the leader of the spirits present, which numbered 165 in all. So that's apparently 165 different entities that apparently uh, not necessarily haunted this, this, this spirit room, but had been present at a lot of these seances. He was said to, now, to kind of give a better description, because this was really the only one I was able to find that kind of somewhat had an identification, but he was said to be the spirit form of the Welsh of the Welsh buccaneer Henry Morgan, who died in 1688, King and his daughter Katie, who became the most famous when attached to medium Florence Cook, became popular fixtures at the Coon seances and later with the famous Davenport brothers as well. Uh, just going back to the comments quickly. What's going on, Carl? Good to see you. All right, let's get back. Now, the musical part of the evening was usually followed by the appearance of spirit hands that were either luminous themselves 
or 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 illuminated by phosphor phosphorized sheets of paper that were prepared by the coons. So here we go. This is another part of their trick that they had. Visible to a little above the wrist, the hands felt like real flesh, and according to witnesses, were sometimes either hot or cold. Doctor Swan, who requested that a hand, <clears throat> requested that a hand be placed in his own, reported that it felt precisely like the hands of the subjects that I have handled in the dis in the dissecting room. Partridge, who held, who also held out a hand and asked the spirits to take hold of it, said that it gave a distinctive grasp when it touched his hand, but added that it did not feel like the hand of a living person. These phantom hands also played a part in the last feat of the evening. I guess I'm, I think it's supposed to be feature. When the luminous appendages would write messages on pieces of paper, all of those who described their visit to the spirit room saw the hands write out messages and at, at incredible speeds. Many of the witnesses watched the hands from a short distance, but one fascinated spectator pressed so close to watch that the hand playfully poked his nose with the end of a pencil. Of course, <laughs> six, witness, six witnesses from four different states testified that they watched the armless hand write with a pencil. It wrote very slowly, and so one witness asked it to write faster. At this request, the pencil began scrawl scrawling so rapidly across the paper that we could hardly see it go. In five minutes, it had filled the page, which had passed to one of the witnesses, a Mr. Pierce of Philadelphia, who was then given an opportunity to examine the mysterious hand. He reported that it was human in all aspects, even to the fingernails, but was slightly cooler than his own. Pierce then took another sheet of paper and the spirit's pencil and began tracing an outline of the hand on the paper as far as the wrist, but found nothing any further than that point. The hand then shook hands with him and immediately vanished. I don't know what the coons were doing, but they obviously uh <laughs> they obviously were putting on a good show and whatever however they were doing it with these phosphorized phosphorized sheets of paper. It's a pretty good trick. Yeah, it even says it is believed that this was family members tricking the guests. So reports of these wonders traveled all across America, and hundreds came to Mount Nebo claiming that it was a place of spiritual significance and a sacred site even to the Shawnee Indians. According to some sources, a psychical society Christian Mount Nebo as one of the most haunted spots in the world. By 1856, however, Coons had been accused of fraud, which damaged his reputation and has made his family reluctant to continue. Their farm also cannot continue to operate while housing so many guests nearly six nights a week as Kuntz took only donations for viewing seances. As for the Kuntz, their spirit room continued to operate and attract visitors until the end of 1858. By this time, they were competing with another spirit room that had been started by the Tippy family who lived three miles across the valley from the Coons. It was never as popular, but it managed to draw some of the visitors who came searching for the spirits of Mount Nebo. And that's, again, no surprise that, you know, especially in that era, and we still kind of deal with such things like this today, but when you, when you put something together, especially that's not very common, especially in the mid-19th century, you know, that is going to attract a lot of people, even if you don't didn't make any money out of it, just knowing that it was going to attract attention from across the country, there's always going to be someone else, or even in, in this case, an entire family that in some way is going to be kind of cashing in on that popularity and wanting that same attention to themselves. But for the most part, as you can see in this case for the Tippy family, they didn't have as much success as the Coons did. So what I never really found out whether they were just doing this for attention 
or if they were doing this for money or for both or claim that they actually had, you know, paranormal activity occurring, it, it was not as huge. They did not, they were not as successful as the Coons because understandably the Coons were the first successful family, at least in that area of Ohio to do that. So a lot of times these people that try to follow behind it don't make as much, as much success unless they really have some kind of significance to them. So, and, and, and you can kind of see here too, the tippies who had 10 children also boasted musical performances by the spirits, but visitors were reportedly disappointed that no spectral hands appear. And that's the other thing too. Sometimes when you got these people that want to come out, they're going to want to experience, they, they have that expectancy of what is supposed to occur. And when it doesn't occur, obviously makes a lot of people disappointed. So as a result, both families later moved out of the area with the Tippies to Colorado and the Coons to Illinois. After this, Jonathan Coons announced that spirit John King had departed, and this tin horn was now silent. Coons contributed to letters to the spiritual telegraph for a time and then lapsed into silence himself. Eventually, he and his family disappeared from the annals of spiritualism altogether. Even if all the reports were made by avowed spiritualists who visited the spirit room only to confirm their beliefs, the general agreement of the spirit accounts seemed to offer evidence pointing toward the fact that the Coons were not putting on a fraudulent performance. And that's what I said earlier. I think some of it may have been probably, you know, acted out or may have been fraud in some way, but I think on other occasions that they act, they had actual activity occurring. So that's why I said earlier that it was kind of a 50-50, if you will. So the Coons apparently gave up their medium. Oh, wait, it already says something like that. Okay. Already apparently gave up their medium performances and moved to Illinois. In an obituary for no Nahum Coons, he died in 1921 at the age of 84 in Franklin County, Illinois. Now um, for Nahum, he and his family had accompanied his father and mother to Franklin County, where they lived for about 10 years before moving to Perry County, near DeCoin. Nahum then uh, then moved to Perry County, Missouri, until, eight, until 1880, when he again returned to Illinois in the farm that he and his father purchased after leaving Ohio. He also lived in Oklahoma, I forgot to write. It's it. Well, Oklahoma wasn't a state then, so I meant to say was he also lived in Oklahoma Territory in Arkansas for a time after the death of his wife in 1899. He remained a spiritualist, however, throughout his life, which was described by those who knew him as exemplary. As a re, um, as a result for Nahum, he passed away in his sleep on August on August 26. You know what? Um, now, kind of looking at it, Nahum. Okay, so the one who died in 1921 was actually Nahum Kuhn. So I'm gonna have to rearrange that later. But okay, so he he passed away in his sleep on October 26, 1921, leaving no clues to why he had abandoned what was apparently an amazing career as a medium, which again was rare at that time because a lot of them were usually revealed as fakes or acts or frauds. Now, unfortunately, while the actual location of the spirit room has not been found, this story is still more truth than fiction. Graves of deceased Coons children were found in the area. Doc documents detailing the trek to the spirit room still exist, and descendants of Jonathan Coons have been found. Some still in possession of the artifacts the dead told him to find, which on Surprisingly, there are no photographs of any of the uh, descendants of Jonathan Coons um, or any of the artifacts that still managed to survive. Again, I tried looking for uh, I tried looking for those fo for any photos or anything, honestly, and I just I just couldn't find it, sadly. So I I'm sorry about that. But um, Coons was well known for his essays, even writing in newspapers about spiritualism. Coons' gift was his ability to write, Hatfield said. 
but his eldest son, Nahum, had a gift of his own. Nahum was the voice of the trumpet, Hatfield said. Whenever Nahum was present at a seance, voices would speak through a trumpet in the room, at times conversing with those in the room. If Kunz's son was not there, the trumpet was quiet for the night. Students of spiritualist history are sure to recognize through that the recognize through that the coons were groundbreakers as far as manifestations go. Many of the happenings at their seances were also reported at later seances uh, under the control of entirely unrelated mediums, which is again no surprise. The mobile musical instruments were part of the attractions offered by the Davenport brothers and the spectral hands were seen at many seances, including those of D.D. Home. The hands that materialized during his sittings resemble in every respect the hands that were seen and felt in the spirit room. In some cases, these manifestations were exposed as being fraudulent, but not in all cases. So some of it was possibly legit. And for the most part, in the ones that were fraudulent, the methods were used to make the instruments fly and the hands appear were beyond the means and the skill of the Coons family. So essentially you had also a few of these mediums that even if someone was exposed as fraudulence, um, they, they did it in a way that not even the Coons family themselves could even, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? I don't know what the hell that was, but. Um, oh, that was something that fell right in front of the desk. I'll grab it later. Um, yeah, it was something that not even themselves could even replicate. The case of the spirit room, like some of the other aspects, of, I mean, as, as a result, the case of the spirit room, like some of the other aspects of spiritualism, remains unsolved. And believe it or not, even today, uh, it is said that Mount Nebo is still plagued by paranormal activity left over from the Coons' days of talking to the dead. And that is officially it of that slideshow. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that one. Uh, I do have a couple more. Just want to get to the comments quickly. Uh, so Eric here just said, that doesn't make any sense. How can you fool someone that has a doctor even back then? He would be more scientific. You know... <sighs> It's a really good question. I think part of it may have something to do with, again, you know, in the mid-19th century, some of these fraudulent mediums and, and these other early investigators out there figure out ways that could try to really defy explanation. Um, yes, sometimes it was later found out to be fake, but they they sometimes really did put on a good show to really convince what they were seeing was paranormal. But again, not all of it was later found out to be fake. Some of it actually was true activity that occurred. So, again, yes, some of it was fake, but for the things that did happen, I still had to get, give kudos for Jonathan Coons and his family. So, in matter of fact, I actually have a list of all these different investigators. Usually the one, I usually, I kind of skipped the ones that were, that were found to later, out, later find out to be frauds. But so I usually stuck to a lot of the legit ones, but I actually have a list or what I would call the closest you could ever get to as a paranormal memorial list of the names of all these different early paranormal investigators and spiritualists, as well as psychics, mediums, um, clairvoyants, sensitives, uh, empaths, um, Sense, uh, you know, like uh, even even some of the witches and supposed witches or whatever. I have this whole list that dates back literally almost 200 years of these early investigators that goes all the way from that time up to our paranormal brothers and sisters who've recently passed recent, you know, to the present time. So it's probably the closest I've ever created for a paranormal memorial. And Jonathan Coons, surprise. Not surprisingly, he is on that list. Um, yeah, I can't say either way because I wasn't there. Yep, see, you, you make a good point there, Charles. So, anyways, I do have another slideshow ready to go. So, give me a 
Give me one second here so I can get it prepared. And this one, it is a real short one once again, but I will say this. This one is, uh, <laughs> we're going to be taking this to a different direction. It's still going to be paranormal, but I have not even delved into the subject yet. So this is the first for this one. Okay, so let's see here. All right, let's go through this. Okay. Just checking on the screen to make sure it's showing. All right. So, next place we got again, this is this is not going to take that long at all. Um we're next, our next location we're going to focus on is U.S. Route 50. Now, I notice, obviously, I have a different color in the chi- in, in the title than what I normally would use. Unless you can understand it right away, you'll get it eventually why it's uh, a green title this time. Oh, I forgot to add the transition to that. But to talk a little bit about the history of U.S. Route 50, in 1912, the route became known, would become, I mean, the route that would become US 50 was designated Main Market Route 45. In 1923, market, Main Market Route 45 was decommissioned and SR 7 replaced it from Indiana to Cincinnati, SR 27 from Cincinnati to Milford, and SR 26 from Milford to Athens. U.S. 50 replaced SR 144 from Athens to Coolville and SR 7 from Coolville to West Virginia State Line. At this time, the route that later became U.S. 50 was paved between Indiana and Highland, Ross County Line. In 1926, U.S. 50 was signed on a, on a route similar to today. The current route that U.S. 50 between Athens and West Virginia became U.S. 50S in 1929, with the current SR-50 becoming U.S. 50 North. U.S. Okay, so I think I, I think I get it now what M's, S obviously stands for. U.S. 50 North, um, excuse me, U.S. 50 South and U.S. 50 North would be replaced with U.S. 50 and U.S. 50 Alternate in 1935. The Columbia Parkway in Cincinnati was completed in 1941, and US 50 was rerouted onto the parkway. The road west of Cincinnati became a four-lane divided highway in 1949. In 1965, the Sixth Street Expressway opened, and US 50 was rerouted onto the expressway. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Also in that year. The section of U.S. 50 that is concurrency with SR7 became a four-lane divided highway. U.S. 50 was routed on to the eastern section of the Athens Bypass when it opened in 1977. The western section was opened in 1979, and U.S. 50 was route on to that year. U.S. 50 between Athens and Coolville became a four-lane divided highway between 1997 and in 1999, between 2003 and 2007, a new bridge across the Ohio River was built. And see, again, this shows how how short this one is, but there's more to it than this. This is not officially the end. The section of the Columbia Parkway between William Howard Taft Road to, and slash Torrance Parkway and Delta Avenue has numerous abandoned staircases built into the Art Deco built into the Art Deco retaining walls, which were constructed in 1938 as part of the Work Progress Administration. The city of Cincinnati began the process of sealing up these staircases in 2008. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to, there were really not that many photos I could find really of the history involved, like historical pictures of the road itself. And that's why I don't even really have it. A modern day picture. I mean, I'll I'll try to look afterwards. I just didn't have one for today. But there's more to this world than that. And believe it or not, usually I'm always focusing on ghost stories. However, this is what I meant earlier. We're going to be taking this a different route. 
The route itself, believe it or not, is not actually haunted. But there was a very unusual, and if you want to use the term, unearthly event that occurred on that road 40 years ago. So, for the first time ever, it's not long. I wish there was more information. This is all I was able to find. For the first time, we're going to be dubbing a little bit into UFOs. And what I'm about to show, is, unfortunately, is really short. I wish I would, again, I wish I had more, but this is all I was able to find. And this is not, I could, this is not obviously an actual artistic imagery of what happened this night, but I wanted to give the UFO feeling to it. So apparently three eyewitnesses observed an enormous UFO while traveling in their van along U.S. Route 50, just outside of Athens in 1983. The three claimed to have been energized for hours after the sighting. And I'm sorry to say, but that's it for that. <laughs> I, again, I tried going all around to see if I could find any other sites about um, about this UFO encounter, and I just, I just could not find that much, which is highly unusual. What's going on, Jacqueline? Good to see you. Appreciate it. So, uh, but at least in some way, we really kind of delve a little bit into the UFO encounters, which eventually we will be getting into. Because like I said, it, talking about all these haunted historical places is always great. But eventually I want to try to get into ufology, cryptozoology, even what's known as vampirology that actually does exist. Demonology, of course, which I have done a few times. But in the meantime, once again, in spite of how short that was, I do have yet yeah, I do have another slideshow ready to go. So let me get the next one. And this one, too, again, is a really short one. But as short as this one is, this one has a really interesting appearance to it, even outside the history and paranormal side of this location. So give me one second here once again. And... So the next location I got here, which is, I think, with, it's not actually in Athens itself, but it's in the town of Coolville, which is still part of Athens County. So this, this location is what's known as Bethel Cemetery. There's not really too much actually really to talk about the history, but I still decided to add it as a history section. But the Bethel Cemetery, this is what's going to stand out from a lot of the other ones and a lot of other cemeteries that, you know, most of us are very familiar with. The Bethel Cemetery is known for its questionable layout of graves that are puzzling due to their strange direction. I don't know if you guys can really tell by this photograph, but I'll explain a little bit further. It is common knowledge, as we all know, that the majority of cemeteries plan out the graves I mean, plan out the graves to face east to west, naturally aligning with the rising sun. But this graveyard has a set of plots that are arranged north to south, which isn't a normal layout for a cemetery and with no visible explanation as to why. In addition, many of the graves are sunken. As you can probably see from some of these graves, I mean, it does appear like some of them are sunken. These other ones here, I think, are a little bit more modern and more recent. So these ones are still up. But they all face basically like almost the opposite direction compared to what you would normally see you would normally see in other cemeteries. So already going quick to the ghost stories. Um, old county records offer little explanation in folklore. And I mean, old county records offer little explanation. And folklore offers a very degree of possible explanation explanations. Unfortunately, sorry, that was just my cat. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it is believed that this may have may be the cause as to why this graveyard remains so restless with tired ghosts that never appear to quiet down, which is no not surprising. It is believed that Bethel Cemetery is haunted by Civil War soldiers. Orbs and apparitions are regulars at the cemetery, as are strange sounds, bad odors, cold temperatures, and unexplained feelings of being watched by something not of this world. The cemetery is always cold, even during hot summer days. 
the heck are you doing? Sorry. <laughs> Damn cap. Quit making noise. <laughs> and that's, again, that's it of that cemetery. So, again, this show goes to show once again how unusually short some of these slideshows are. But, uh, again, I try to go through as much websites of what I'm able to find, and they, it just doesn't really – there's just some locations where they just don't have a lot of information I could find. And, and trust me, I know some of you guys are probably familiar with this website. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with findagrave.com. I have gone to find a grave to, uh, to try to find whatever details they have to offer on that cemetery, on some of these cemeteries. And sometimes they just, they just have little to no information regarding the history of these locations. So, with that being said, on to our next one. <laughs> this one is, is also a really short one. Again, probably even shorter than the last one. But I promise you, the next one after this one will probably remain, we'll probably be able to focus on for the rest of the show. So give me one second here. Play with this all over again. All right, so now on to slideshow. I believe that was okay. So on to slideshow number four. So the next one is what's known as the Old Millfield Inn, which I think is right outside of. I don't know if it's in Athens itself again, but I know it's uh, in Athens County. So even though for the most part we're focusing on most of the locations in the town of Athens. I didn't exclude, obviously, a lot of the other locations within the county itself of Athens. So, again, this is really the only slide and the only source of info I was able to find on this. So we're going to get right down to the ghost stories already. And and believe it or not, I couldn't even find that many pictures of even what it looks like modernized other than what you guys just saw. So built in 1811. This now abandoned inn is haunted by two ghosts. One is said to be the ghost of a slave named Luther who died there of an infected wound when the building was part of the Underground Railroad. Since his death, his spirit has been seen floating around the home, dragging his damaged leg. The other ghost of the inn is a bootlegger named Sam. He was killed in a drunken state when his illegal still exploded. Witnesses have reported drunken laughter coming from the inn. And again, see how see how I, how short I told you. Again, <laughs> anytime when basic anytime when I basically go through these sites, I do have to have when I put these presentations. I'm always going to be under the expectation that some of them are just going to be really really short. I mean, not all of them are winners. Again, I do my homework as much as I can on these and there's just again there's just not much you can really do uh eric you, you didn't know about that the find a grave website yeah they have a website called findagrave.com it's uh it helps you locate different cemeteries even if they were some even if they're older cemeteries that no longer operate they usually have them on their websites and of course and additionally and understandably they also keep records of not everybody but a lot of recorded burials that have occurred in over the probably about last 200, 300 years, not necessarily saying that they've been around since then, but they have kept the records and they're still following with modern day recorded uh, recent deaths that occurred. So you got any family members or anything like that, you know, anybody close to you who passed away, there's a good likely chance that you might be able to find them. Um, course understandably too sometimes people that we we we've known you know will sometimes have the same name so you got you got to you're going to have to kind of search carefully unless you're able to find what makes it easier to uh, find those that whether it's a family member or friend who passes if there's a photograph then yeah you won't be searching for very long um all right so lauren here just said i found a lot of my ancestors yep see just like that's a primary example right there. You found a lot of your ancestors' graves using the Find a Grave website. It's a great website. 
uh, to find, you know, your past relatives and ancestors. Fantastic site. So, but yeah, Eric, I'm really surprised you haven't heard of that. So, but that's where I get some of these, this information from when I put my cemetery presentations to get, I mean, presentations, cemetery presentations together. Okay. So we got about 20 minutes left. So therefore, as I kind of said for last week, I, or maybe it was the week before, I think we have time for one more slideshow. And this one, like I said, should last for the majority of the show. So let's get to it. <laughs> All righty. So on to slideshow number five. And, and also while I'm, and, and while I'm getting this set and ready, this one has a similar name to the other location, but you guys will realize very quickly that it's a completely different location. It is called Old Millfield again, but this time it's a different location in this area. Thank you, Rita. I really appreciate it. Hang on one second. Here we go. Unfortunately, this is the last time I got to play around with this. All right, just check out on the screen. And for some reason, I got some kind of not feedback, but for some reason, the show is not not cooperative. Okay, here we go. All right, we're good. We're good then. <laughs> I was trying to figure out why is the screen frozen from my side, but it, it was just a delay. So the final location i have for today before we call it quits again similar name but different title but different place entirely so it's known as the old millfield mine which is now abandoned and again this place in spite of what happened here i just again especially for you know there there was there's just not that many pictures i could find which i was really surprised by this i think it might surprise a few of you guys too on this but right from the start about this old abandoned mine it had a really really rough history this is i believe i don't know if this is the one that would eventually fall into fall into disaster but i know it was one of the mines that did exist at that time so unfortunately this mine was the, ser the scene of a series of explosions in the early 1900s. A cemetery that had been opened only a week earlier in Chauncey was filled in one day because of the explosions. Now, among one of the explosions that occurred on Wednesday, November 5th, 1930, 182 Sunday Creek Colt, 180. 182 Sunday Creek Coal Company miners were gathered near two hoisting cages, waiting their turn to descend in groups of 10,189 feet into the main shaft opening of the number six mine. It was a cool, cloudy day. Temp temperatures were dipping into the low 40s. Nine Sunday Creek Coal Company officials and visitors were there, perhaps the subject of some miners' concert conversations the officials had gathered for a tour and would follow the miners into the mine included in the group were w.e titus in pa pa cohen president and vice president of sunday creek coal company h.h H. upson assistant to mr titus h.e lancaster chief mine manager and uh excuse me chief mine engineer and walter hayden mine superintendent apart from the unusual presence of sunday creek's top officials this day appeared no different to the miners than any other day mining coal at the number six mine however this day would end tragically as no other day in ohio's mining history the number six mine was located about one mile east of millfield dover township athens county in 1930, Millfield was a community of about 1,500, 
many of whom who worked who worked in the number six mine. Other miners who worked in the number six mine lived in nearby communities, including Gloucester, Jacksonville, Sand Hill, Sugar Creek, and Trimble. The number six mine, formerly known as the Poston Number Six, was opened by the Millfield Coal Mining Company, founded by Clinton L. Poston and George H. Smith and leased to the Poston Consolidation Company in 1911. The first coal from the mine was loaded on March 4, 1912. In September 1929, Sunday Creek Coal Company acquired the Poston No. 6 mine. The, the Sunday Creek Coal Company was a major corporation, the second largest coal company in the world in 1905. Included in the company's holdings, were 60 mining properties, 30, 33 of which were in Ohio. So you had about more than half of them in the state of Ohio at that time. The new owners suspended regular operation of the Poston No. 6 mine on April 11, 1930, in order to make much-needed repairs and improvements. Upgrades to the mine included the addition of brick walls and 8-inch steel I-beams, 22 feet in length and to support the roof along the main haulage road double rows of electric lighting several hundred feet in length strung along the entries new double haulage tracks and switches and the construction of a new ventilation shaft located about 1.4 miles northwest of the of the main hoisting shaft the renovated number six mine resumed full operation by august 11th the number six mine had been developed on the Roman pillar system and had double and triple entryways for ventilation, passage of men, and coal haulage. Conventional mining was used in the number six mine. The work, whoops, excuse me, the working of the middle panning number six coal seam was undercut using coal cutting machines that looked like oversized chainsaws. Once the coal had been undercut, Several holes were dr drilled into the working face. Explosive charges of pellet powder were then inserted into the holes and detonated. Following the explosive shot, the loosened blocks of coal were loaded into coal cars by hand. The loaded coal cars were taken to the main hoisting shaft by electric shuttle engines and then raised up the shaft to be unloaded at the tipple. At the, as the miners advanced the working face farther into the seam of coal, track layers would ha hammer additional rails into place, and other workers would install steel I-beams or wooden timbers for roof support. By November, about 5,000 tons of coal were being mined every 24 hours, five days a week. The mine operated by double shifts. The coal was shipped from the number from the number six mine by the Kanawha and Michigan Railroad. Conventional mining was strenuous and dirty work, even with the best mining machinery of the day. Usually work stopped only for 30-minute meal breaks. That's quite a job that they had to make. I mean, that's what a lot of people throughout the, a lot of people, especially men throughout the early 20th century, that was quite a job for them. I mean, there were times where sometimes they did some of these coals, they, coal these mining jobs they made good money but certainly this was a dangerous job it wasn't always just men if you guys are not familiar with that i mean some of the history involved it wasn't always just adults there were even younger people that you know i'm talking young teenage boys and even younger who worked in the mines sometimes unfortunately and sadly it was through force but there were others that sometimes they just desperately needed the money so, unfortunately, without warning, tragedy struck suddenly at 11.45 a.m. on Wednesday, November 5th, shortly after the miners' lunch break. A tremendous explosion, explosion erupted at the rear of the mine, several hundred feet from the working face. The explosion occurred 10,200 feet from the main shaft. A group of 79 miners working about 4,700 feet from the main shaft, heard a terrific slam and a whistling noise of a powerful gale, gale approaching them from the northern portion of the mine. Instinctively, 
Some miners dropped to the floor of the mine, while others were knocked out as a great gust of wind passed over them. This gust of wind was followed shortly afterward by a second rush of air passing in the opposite direction. E.W. Smith, in an unpublished 1930 report, stated, These men were thrown about by the force of the explosion, but none of them were seriously injured, and all of them were able to leave the mine by the main motor road, which was the intake area airway of the mine. Initially, some of the miners thought the noise and wind were a result of a major roof fall. However, they quickly realized that an explosion had occurred in the mine and retreated to safety out of the mine under the direction under the direction of section foreman Robert Marshall. The first indication at the surface of trouble in the mine was when Ed Dempsey, a miner working at the top of the new air shaft, was knocked off the ventilation housing by a sudden burst of air followed by thick smoke. Word of the explosion spread quickly. Within minutes of the explosion, des- distress calls for assistance were made for medical personnel and supplies. Calls also were made to the Ohio Division of Mines and the U.S. Bureau of Mines for mine rescue personnel and equipment because the number six mine did not have any mine rescue equipment on hand. So as for the actual gas explosion itself, the it was the result of an accumulation of gas in Section 6 North, which was known for being gassy. The ignition was believed to be, I mean, to be caused by an electrical arc between a fallen trolley wire and the rail. The section of the trolley rail where the explosion occurred was broken and therefore inactive. There was no, even strangely, there was no reason for power to be on that line. So, as a result, the explosion caused many of the walls to cave in, wrecking the interior. So, that's the thing, too. For an area that didn't even have any power, it makes no sense whatsoever for an explosion to even happen unless, if there was an electrical arc in this case, the current could have traveled and probably found an exit. If I'm, I'm not really an engineer on this kind of stuff, but... In some way, it must have gotten in contact with possibly the methane gas, which usually builds in mines. And when there's so much of it, or if it comes in contact with any type of electricity, it explodes, of course. And it was, in fact, it was so powerful that cars were pulled off tracks and beams were twisted up to 760 feet from the main shaft. Equipment equipment was also found scorched near the explosion site. The mine had recently undergone improvement, and they were in the process of making more. The president of Sunday Creek Coal Company, W.E. Titus, was giving other top executives a tour of the new safety equipment at the time of the explosion, which I mentioned earlier. They entered the mine shaft. They entered the mine shaft half an hour previously previous to the explosion and it made it about one and a half miles into the mine. And I'm sorry to say, tragically, these men were killed in the disaster. They didn't make, so no disasters from, excuse me, no survivors from that group. They didn't make it. So, fully, there were about 250 men at the mine that day, and many of them, however, were able to escape were able to escape after the explosion however nearly 100 now to kind of give a full count nearly 120 men escaped from the interior of the mine one way or another many of them also used i mean many of them used the ventilation shafts as exits um however first news reports stated that uh, 150 miners were trapped underground as a result of a gas explosion. Families and relatives of the miners, news media personnel, and spectators surged into Millfield to learn the fate of the miners. Distress calls were made to Columbus, Nelsonville, Cambridge, and Pittsburgh. Two companies of the Ohio National Guard were ordered to the mine to help maintain order. 
24 Red Cross nurses, several doctors, and Salvation Army volunteers arrived at the number six mine to tend to the injured. About an hour after the explosion, Andrew Ginnon, District Mine Inspector for the Ohio Division of Mines, arrived at the scene, and with Section Foreman Robert Marshall and Mine Superintendent Pete McKinley entered the number six mine to start cleanup work and restore proper ventilation to the mine. The northern portion of the mine contained, however, carbon monoxide, the deadliest of all mine gases, indeed. Carbon, now, I'm sure we all know this, but I'll still, I'll still, I still put it in anyway. Carbon monoxide, or white damp, is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, lighter-than-air gas that is a combustion product of mine fires and the explosion ignition of methane or coal dust. The mine would not be cleared of carbon monoxide until Sunday morning, November 9th. By 4 p.m., four hours after the explosion, E.W. Smith, Chief Inspector for the Ohio Division of Mines, and three other mine inspectors arrived with mine rescue teams and equipment. Included among the mine rescue equipment were common monoxide detectors, gas masks, and several canaries. canaries. Several hours later, J.J. Forbes, chief engineer for the U.S. Bureau of Mines, and two other mining engineers arrived at Millfield in a railroad car converted into a mobile safety training and mine rescue facility. The U.S. Bureau of Mines personnel brought with them self-contained breathing apparatuses, which allowed workers into the most gas-filled portion of the mine. The force of the explosion was so great that near the point of the explosion, 10,200 feet from the main shaft, electric shuttle engines and mine cars were, see, this is saying the same thing again, were knocked off their tracks, steel eye beams were twisted and blown about like sticks, and wooden timbers were smashed into kingling. In addition, the force of the explosion demolished numerous brick stoppings, ventilation barriers, barriers between adjoining rooms and entries, knocked down trolley wires, ripped up track for a distance of about 760 feet, and scorched equipment for a distance of about 1,640 feet from the point of the ignition. Of ignition, Some of the miners speculated that the explosion was caused by a pocket of methane ignited by the open flame of a miner's lamp. That would do it if that's the case. Even though the number six mine was known to be somewhat gassy, Open flame, open flame carbide lamps were used by the miners working in the mine. Another theory was that a mine car containing pellet powder exploded. However, careful examination of the debris by state and federal mine inspectors revealed that the explosion was triggered by a rock fall that broke an electrical trolley wire cable, which then shorted against an underground train rail, producing an arc which ignited a pocket of methane gas that had collected in that portion of the mine that would actually make a better explanation. Ventilation to the damaged portions of the number six mine was restored slowly. Canneries carried by mine rescue personnel were overcome in three to four minutes by high concentrations, 0.3% of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide concentrations greater than 0.25% can cause a person, person to lose consciousness very quickly and apparently without any pain or suffering. Because the haulage equipment used in the number six mine was electric and electricity to the damaged portion of the mine could not immediately be restored for fear of a second explosion, a dozen mules were brought into the mine to assist in clearing the entries and removing the bodies. By midday on November 6th, rescue personnel wearing self-contained breathing apparatuses had found the last of the bodies. By 7.15 p.m. on November 6th, 78 bodies had been removed from the mine. Four remaining bodies were, reco were recovered the following day. Apparently, most of the deceased were killed by asphyxiation from the carbon monoxide that resulted from the ignition of the methane gas. Only two men were believed to have been killed by
by serious burns from the explosion. The bodies of the official party were found about 200 feet east of the base of the new air shaft. The official party had no, unfortunately had no chance of escape as they were on a nearly direct path with the force of the explosion and carbon monoxide would have flowed past them on its way out the new air shaft. This is actually one of the photos where they did manage to recover some of the bodies. Obviously, it's not those that have the uh, breathing apparatuses on. These were those that were probably above ground. Again, this was one of the few photos I was able to find really of any connection of the disaster. Now, surprisingly, a few miners survived by climbing out a ventilation shaft and additional 19 miners that barricaded themselves from the gas after the explosion were rescued 10 hours after the blast. This is actually some of the, again, some rare photos I was able to find of some of the surviving miners from the explosion. So how they were able to protect themselves is that they used, they used sheets of burlap, mud and sticks to protect themselves from the carbon monoxide. The group of rescued miners were found, most of them unconscious, behind a ventilation partition located about 1,500 feet southwest of the new air shaft, almost two miles northwest of the main shaft. Only two of them were found conscious, but all survived. They were about three miles from the shaft entrance. John Dean, inside foreman, is credited with saving the lives of the rescued miners, including himself. Dean and the other miners erected and gathered behind a ventilation partition, which protected them from a deadly cloud of carbon monoxide. Dean risked his life in several trips into the smoke-filled entries to carry some of his comrades to safety before he collapsed and had to be carried to safety himself. Another heroic effort was shown by James Mackey, fire boss, who nearly lost his life as he climbed partway down into the new air shaft to rescue a stricken comrade who died just as Mackey arrived. Mackey was barely able to climb back out the smoke-filled air shaft. Had he delayed, the effects of the gas would have been fatal. Oh, this already says here, too, dozen mules. I don't need to really read that one. It was important. To, okay, yeah, I was fear of a second foot. So it wasn't. See, they're showing some of the same stuff again. It wasn't until midnight that the first bodies were recovered. Okay, so we'll skip those ones, and I actually do need to fit, wrap this up because I know I'm just about out of time. So to kind of put the entire death toll together, a total of 82 men, which, by the way, right, Larry, right before I got on, I found basically an entire list of all those who died, including the ages of all these men. So. I should have added this, but I'll still say it. A total of 82 men between the ages of 17 to 69 were killed. 73 employees, five company officials, and four visitors made up the 82 men that died in the disaster, making this the worst coal mining disaster in Ohio history. A storage room, a pool hall, and the Sunny Creek Coal Company store at Millfield were turned into temporary morgues. Funeral services were held for the miners on Sunday, November 9th. As a result of this mine explosion, C.H. Harris stated 59 women were widows and 79 sons and 75 daughters of various ages were made fatherless. The health of the few who survived was wrecked in a number of cases. Many families were several times sorrowed. One mother lost five sons. Can you imagine you having a number of your kids working at a mine? And if it if this was all if this was all of her kids losing every single one of them in a mine explosion, it, it it's it's gotta be horrible. Absolutely horrible losing five of your own kids on the same day, even if they were adults, you know, losing all five of your sons in one day, that, that's devastating. So burial of the victims were paid by the state, allowing $150 in each case. Dependents of the miners were compensated at the rate 
of $18.75 a week until exhaustion of a death claim of $6,500 under the workman's compensation law. The disaster attracted national press coverage and international attention and it prompted improvement of Ohio's mine safety laws in 1931. By March 1940, the state had paid to the number six miners and dependents a total of $712,391. The number one, number six mine reopened a, a month later and operated until 1945. The temple of the number six mine, which had stood as a sentinel over the disaster site for nearly 65 years, was recently raised for safety reasons. To a writer's knowledge, no known survivors of the Millfield mine disaster remain living today. In fact, as we are about to get this to a get this to a close, a, monu a monument with the names of the miners killed in the disaster was erected in the town of Millfield in 1975 with the names of the men that were lost in the smokestack at mine number six still stands today. Since the disaster, the Millfield Mine Memorial Committee, which was started in 1973, holds an annual memorial service commemorating the victims, has been held annually at Millfield, and the tragedy lives in the minds of community residents who were in the area at the time of the disaster. Sigmund Kozma, who was 16 years old at the time, he was actually, um, who was 16 years old at the time he survived the, the explosion, was recently identified as the last living survivor of the Millfield mine disaster. And that's what the mine, like I said before, looks like today. There's relatively few photos of what it even looks like now. So for him, he was loading coal with his father and 12 others about 500 feet from the blast. These men barricaded themselves from the poisonous gas and climbed up a ventilation shaft. It took them three hours to escape the mine. He was featured, believe it or not, if you guys can find it, in a documentary of the explosion by Justin Zimmerman, which I forgot it's about the year, in 2001, entitled Meeting Again. Sadly, though, Sigmund Kozma died on January 3rd, 2009, coincidentally on the same day as his wife. He is survived by his five daughters. Now, to cut, believe it or not, for such a tragedy like this, obviously it has a somewhat share of ghost stories, which really, this won't take long at all. Again, it was this was really short of what I was able to, to find. But it is said, apparently, that if one stands right in the right place on the disaster's anniversary, they can feel the ground shake, followed by muffled sounds of hoofbeats. Screams can also be heard, be heard before spectral fire catches up to the souls. Then everything becomes silent. And that is now officially it. So unfortunately, oh my goodness, I did not even realize I was on for this long. Um, let's see. Hello, Patricia. Good to see you. All right. So again, I, I know there's a show right after me on one of the networks, the other networks. So I do apologize for keeping, if I'm keeping them on, but uh, you know, I got to say that's really sad stuff to look at. So, but it was, it was definitely worth putting this together. So, um, yeah, it's, I, and, and trust me, this is not the first time I've actually covered disaster, uh, historical disasters. I actually did that previously and I do plan on doing this again in September, uh, focusing eventually on the great Galveston hurricane of 1900. But anyways, I do have to get going. Uh, as usual, again, I got many more places I'm going to be presenting for next week. So there will be, of course, again, a part five for Athens, Ohio. And uh, we'll, continue we'll continue on our virtual tour, as always, if you will. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, just like with what we were just reading today, we are going to be eventually coming across sad stories like this um, when it comes to these type of locations or events so but as always you know i always appreciate you guys coming in hanging out tuning in because like as i always say every week you know we i not only do this for myself but i do this for you guys because it's a lot of work putting this together so i really appreciate it as always guys and um 
Of course, I'll be back on tomorrow afternoon with Lois and Rosie to the grave and back. And I actually do remember what we were going to be talking about this time. We're at, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the uh, the Jim Jones massacre, which I was actually I was hoping originally we were going to do that in November because later this year is going to be the 45th anniversary of that massacre. But, you know, either way, it was 45 years ago already. Um and that, of course, Supernatural Talk tomorrow night. It will be our one-year anniversary, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And then Friday we have – I know we have a guest coming on. Um, shoot, I can't remember who it was. I always keep forgetting uh, who we have on for Frighteners. But uh, either way, it's going to be a good show. But either way, thank you guys all so much. I got to get off here. Uh I'll probably see some of you guys tomorrow afternoon for uh, to the grave and back on the other shows. But if not, if you're going to wait for the next episode of Nick Files, I will price. I will then see you guys next week. You guys all have a great night.